friends in this video we are going to study the general rules used to plot the root locus of a system okay so let's see what are the various rules start with the first rule the rule number one that is the first step whenever we are plotting the root locus of a system is first determine the open loop poles and the zeros of the system okay from the transfer function which is given to you determine the poles and zeros of that system so first step is to determine all the open loop poles and zeros of open loop transfer function and plot them in S plane. Okay, what you have to do in the first step, you have to determine all the open loop poles and zeros using the open loop transfer function of the system and then plot all the poles and zeros in the S plane. You know that the poles, they are denoted by cross sign and the zeros they are denoted by a circle okay so this is the s plane s plane consists of the imaginary and the real axis it is the imaginary axis and it is the real axis Real axis is the horizontal line and vertical line is the imaginary axis. This is positive imaginary axis, this is negative, this is positive real axis and it is negative real axis. So we have obtained the poles and zeros in the first step and then we will plot them on this S plane and uh, this pole it is represented by cross sign and the zero they are represented by a circle. Okay, so this was all about the first step. Now the second step or the second rule is <coughs> So the rule 2 is related to the starting and the ending points of a root locus that is from where the root locus will start and where it is going to end. So root locus it is the rule number 2 it is the starting and the ending point the root locus it starts from the poles and it terminates at the zeros of the system so the starting point of the root locus is the closed loop pole and the ending point is the zero of the system The root locus as we have said that it starts from the open loop poles and open loop poles uh, also we can say that it is or k equals to 0 that is when the value of the gain k is the gain of the system so whenever the gain is 0 at that point it's uh, the root locus start from that point and it terminates on either the finite open loop zeros or k equals to infinite 
okay that is it is starting from a open loop pole and terminating at open loop zeros or we can say that it is starting from k equals to zero point and terminating at k equals to infinity so whenever we are plotting the root locus just remember that it will start from a pole and it will terminate at a zero next is rule number three Rule number three is related to the number of branches of the root locus. We are plotting the root locus. How we are going to uh, get that? What will be the number of branches? How many branches this root locus is going to have? So rule number three is number of branches of root locus. Up till now, up till this rule number three, or we can say step number three, we have just obtained the open loop poles and the zeros. Okay, so number of branches it is determined by the number of poles and the number of zeros. If the number of poles, number of poles means p, it is greater than the number of zeros, then the number of branches of root locus equals the number of poles. Suppose that a system is having number of poles as 5 and number of zeros is 3 so number of poles is greater than number of zeros 5 is greater than 3 so the total number of branches of the root locus will be equal to the number of poles that is there will be 5 branches now if the number of zeros is greater than the number of poles then the number of branches of root locus equals the number of zeros okay so if p is greater than z then the number of branches equals to the number of poles if z is greater than p then the number of branches is equal to the number of zeros Okay, let's take an example so that you can clearly understand it. Suppose that if P is equals to 2 and Z is equals to 5. Okay, that is the number of poles of the system is 2 and number of zeros of a system is 5. So in this case, Z is greater than P. Okay, so when Z is greater than P, then number of branches... will be equal to number of zeros now here number of zeros is what five so there will be five branches now as we have said that root locus it starts from the pole and terminates at zero so root locus starts from pole So the root locus start from the poles and terminates at zero. Now here we are having two poles and five zeros. So two branches they will start from the pole and terminate at the zero. And the remaining branches they will start from a location of the open loop poles. Now what will be the case we have uh, total branches will be 5 and number of poles is 2 so 3 branches remaining branches will be 3 branches they will start from infinity while 2 branches will start from 
the open loop poles okay because two for two poles we are having two zeros so two branches will start from the open loop poles and the remaining three branches they will start from infinity and how they are going to terminate all the five branches will terminate at the five finite locations of so all the five branches they will terminate at the five finite locations of zeros so this was when the case when we have the number of zeros greater than the number of poles now take another example where the number of poles is greater than number of zeros so suppose if p is greater than z that is p is equals to 5 and z is equals to 3 so what will be that case we have five poles and we have three zeros so three poles are going to start from the poles and terminate at the zeros so three branches how many branches we are going to have it will be equal to the number of poles number of branches equals to number of poles and it will be 5 so out of these 5 branches 3 branches will start from poles and terminate at zeros now we are left with two branches so what these two branches will two branches they are going to start from the pole and terminate at infinity because we are having only three zeros so the remaining two branches they will terminate at infinity so this is how the number of branches and their locations will change according to the number of poles and zeros if we are having z uh, that is number of zeros greater than poles then the branches uh, which we are having three branches they are start from infinity and two branches will start from the poles and all these branches they will terminate at the zeros if we have poles greater than zeros then three branches will start from poles and terminate at the zeros and the remaining two branches they will start from infinity and terminate at the uh, start from the poles and terminate at infinity so this was the rule number three that is the third step while we are plotting the root locus uh, and through this step we will be able to determine the number of branches of the root locus now let's see the fourth rule now rule number four it determines the direction of the branches okay we have obtained the number of branches now what will be the direction of the branches so determination of direction of root loci on the real axis. Locus is plural and root loci, loci it is singular. So the branches of the root loci what will be the direction of those branches on the real axis so how we can determine it a branch of root locus lies on the real axis if the total number of open loop poles and zeros
to the right side of the point is odd so a branch of root locus it will lie on the real axis if the total number of open loop poles and zeros to the right hand side of the point is odd okay that is odd number of poles and zeros are present on the right hand side of that point let's take an example so that you can understand it This is the S plane that is the imaginary axis. And this is the real axis. Real axis means sigma. Now plot the uh, poles and zeros of a system. Suppose we are having a pole at the location plus 2. And here we are having a 0 at s equals to minus 1. We are having a pole at s equals to minus 2. So we are having two poles s equals to minus 2 and s equals to plus 2. And we are having a 0 s equals to minus 1. This is the positive imaginary axis, negative imaginary axis. This is positive real axis and it is negative real axis. So we have plotted the poles and zeros of a system. Now to determine the direction, let's have check one and the other poles. First we will start from this pole. We want to find the direction of the root locus for this pole S equals to minus 2 okay so if you want to determine the direction take two points one on the left hand side and one on the right hand side okay left hand side point denoted is at p2 and this right hand side point denoted as p1 let's check for each of these points that what will be the number of the poles and zeros on the right hand side of that point starting from this point right side of this point p1 okay so for point p1 point p1 is here on the right hand side if you check the total number of poles and zeros we have one and two that is two poles and zeros so two is is it is an even number so the direction of the root loci for this pole will not be in this direction because the total number of poles and zeros is even so it will not be in this direction now check for point p2 we have here even number of poles and zeros now for point p2 if we check let's take the total number of poles and zeros on the right hand side we have one two three so there are three poles and zeros so for point p2 we are having three poles and zeros on the right hand side so point p2 we have odd number of poles and zeros on the right hand side. So the direction of the root loci for this pole S equals to minus 2 will be in this direction. Because for point P2 it is having odd number of poles and zeros. So root loci will be in this direction that is moving towards the minus infinity. So it is the root locus plot for this pole S equals to minus 2. So in this way you are going to plot the root locus for every pole. Here the root locus it is starting from the pole and it is terminating at minus infinity. Okay going towards infinity. Now if we check for this pole again have two points here. This is suppose P3 and this is P4. Check for P3 the number of poles and zeros on the right hand side. It is what? 
one. So one is an odd number. So for this pole, the direction of root loci will be in this direction. Okay. It will start from the pole and terminate at this zero. And if we check for point P4, the number of poles on zeros on the right hand side, it is zero. So it's an even number. So the direction of root loci will not be in this uh, point towards this point P4. It will be towards point P3 and it will start from the pole, terminate at zero. So in this way, you are going to find out the direction of the root loci on the real axis. Okay, so it was our step number four. Now, rule number five or step number five. Now, in step fourth, we have determined the direction of the root loci on the real axis. Suppose there are two poles on the real axis which are adjacent to each other. So, that is, uh, in this example, we were having a pole, then a zero, and then a pole. If these two poles, they are adjacent to each other, and the direction of the root loci for these two poles is towards each other, then these two root loci, they are going to coincide at one point okay they are going to meet at one point and that point is called the breakaway point so our rule number five it is related to the calculation of this breakaway point so fifth is our breakaway point and what is a breakaway point when two branches move towards each other on the real axis coincident point is called break away point Okay, that is, this is the real axis and imaginary axis. We are having two poles here. Okay, now for this pole, the direction of root loci is in this direction. And for this pole, we are having the direction of root loci here. So these two root loci or these two branches of the root locus, they are going to meet at one point. And this point is called the breakaway point. This is our pole number one and this is our pole two. So whenever two poles, they are adjacent to each other, that is close to each other, then the branches of the root locus from these two poles, they are going to meet at a point and that coincident point is called the breakaway point. So this breakaway point, it occurs between two adjacent open loop poles on the real axis. Now, how we can calculate this breakaway point? It can be calculated by differentiating the GS, that is the open loop transfer function of the system with respect to S and that equating uh, and after that equate that differentiation what you have get to zero. So breakaway point, it can be calculated using the formula or what we are doing we are differentiating dgs by gs that is the open loop transfer function with respect to it and equating it to zero it can be calculated by differentiating open loop transfer function gs with respect to s and 
and then equating it to zero. So when we differentiate this gs with respect to s then we will get an equation in terms of s and this equation uh, will be equals to 0. Then simplify this equation and obtain the value of s. And that value of S, what which you have obtained after simplifying this equation, will be the breakaway point. So, the appropriate value of S is called breakaway point. Okay. So, whenever you are obtaining two adjacent poles, the branches from these poles, they will coincident at a point and that point, coincident point is called the breakaway point. How you are going to calculate it? You will differentiate the transfer function, open loop transfer function with respect to S and then equate that equation to 0. Simplify this equation to determine the value of S and the value of S what, uh, which you have got is the breakaway point. So this was our rule number 5. Now rule number 6 Now rule number 6 it is used in the cases when we are having higher values of the gain k. So as the value of this k increases the root locus it will move away from the poles. Okay, so as the value of k increases, the root loci moves away from the poles and zeros. Okay, so as the value of k increases, it will move away from the poles and zeros. So in that cases, that is for higher values of k, the root locus, it is approximated by the asymptotes. Okay, now in the, those cases where the value of k is high, we will use asymptotes for the plotting of the root locus. So for higher values of k, The root locus branches are approximated by asymptotes. What are asymptotes? So what is an uh, asymptote? Asymptote is suppose we are having a curve and we are having a line which is just going this side. This is a straight line and it is a curve. So the line which is just touching or just going uh, across this uh, curve it is called the asymptotes. So whenever we are having higher values of k, the root locus branches, they are approximated by asymptotes. Now these asymptotes or these straight lines, they are going to intersect the real axis at some point. So how we are going to determine the intersection point of these asymptotes with the real axis? We have a formula for it. So in this rule number 6, we are first having a point that is the determination of intersection point of asymptotes with real axis. Now, uh, first you have to determine that how many number of asymptotes we are going to have. 
so the number of asymptotes will be equal to the number of poles of the system that is number of poles if suppose there are two uh, a system is having two poles then there will be two asymptotes so number of asymptotes will be equal to the number of poles of the system okay now these asymptotes what will be the intersection point of these asymptotes with the real axis we are going to calculate it by using a formula so this formula is x is the intersection point and it is given by summation of p minus summation of z upon p minus z what is p and what is z p is the number of poles and z is the number of zeros of the system summation of p means you have to sum up the values of all the poles of the system and summation of z means you have to sum up all the zeros of the system and x is the intersection point so let's define all these variables x was what intersection point of the asymptotes with real axis and what was summation of p it was summation of all poles of open loop transfer function and we have summation of z so it is summation of all zeros of open loop transfer function then we have p p is the total number of poles and z is total number of zeros that is again writing the formula we are having x equals to summation of p minus summation z upon p minus z let's take an example here uh, suppose a system is having poles as s equals to 0 minus 1 and then minus 2 and zeros it is having as s equals to 1 and 4 okay so what is the intersection point here we are having x equals to summation of poles means 0 minus 1 minus 2 so 0 minus 1 minus 2 what it will be minus 3 so minus 3 and then minus 0 summation will be 4 plus 1 it will be 5 then how many number of poles we are having we are having three poles and two zeros so three minus two so x will be equals to minus three minus five that is minus eight upon three minus two is one so the intersection point of the asymptote with the real axis is x equals to minus eight that is at minus eight the asymptote is going to intersect with the real axis so in this uh, using this formula we are going to find out the intersection point now second point in this is the angle of asymptotes this uh, asymptote when it is intersecting the real axis then it will be forming some angle with the real axis so how we are going to determine that angle of the asymptotes so our second point is angle of asymptotes asymptotes are drawn at point x x is the intersection point so we are going to draw the asymptote at u this point x point so asymptotes are drawn at point x making an angle with the real axis 
and this angle is given by the formula we have 2m plus 1 into 180 degree divided by p minus z so this is the formula for calculating the angle of the asymptotes here m is 0 1 2 till p minus z minus 1 okay p is the number of poles of the open loop transfer function and z is the number of zeros suppose we are having four poles and two zeros so it will be four minus two that is two and here we were having four minus two minus one that is two minus one so one so m will be zero okay so the value of m will be from 0 and to p minus z minus 1 and we will put this value of m here and then the number of poles and zeros and then we are going to calculate the angle of the asymptotes okay so this was our rule number 6 now rule number 7 In the fourth, uh, the fifth point, we have determined the intersection of the branches of the root locus with the real axis. Now, these branches of the root locus, they are going to intersect the imaginary axis also. So, how in the rule 7, we are going to determine the point at which the branches of the root locus, they are going to intersect the imaginary axis. So, rule number 7 is to determine... the points where the root loci branches intersect the imaginary axis. So how we are going to find out this point? Now the point at which the branches they intersect the imaginary axis we can get this is what j omega and this is our real axis so whenever we put s equals to j omega and we will uh, make the real part as zero then that point will be this imaginary axis so in the equation in the characteristic equation if we put s equals to j omega then when, uh, then we will be able to get the point of intersection of the root locus with the imaginary axis because root locus is what root locus is the locus of the points points we can say roots so it is the so it is the locus of the point so we can say the roots of the characteristic equation that is these are the points which are satisfying this characteristic equation now if you want to determine the intersection of this root locus with the j omega axis that means that point is lying on that root locus and satisfying this characteristic equation now point on the uh, imaginary axis will be s equals to j omega so if we put s equals to j omega in the characteristic equation then we are we will be able to get that point of intersection of the root locus with the imaginary axis so there are two methods to determine this point first method is to put s equals to j omega in the characteristic equation and make real part and imaginary part equal to 0 and simplify 
these equations for omega and k. Omega is the frequency and k is the gain. So put s equals to j omega in the characteristic equation. You are going to get an equation having both real and the imaginary parts. Take out the real parts, uh, separate the real and the imaginary parts. Equate the real part and imaginary parts to zero. You will get two values for s and then simplify these equations. Get the value of omega and k. So this is the point where the the uh, root locus branch it is going to intersect the imaginary axis now second method is to use the roots stability criteria second is using the roots stability criteria root stability criteria we have already studied in our previous video so using that root stability criteria also we can find the point of intersection of the root locus branch with the imaginary axis now take an example so that you will be able to understand how we are going to use these two methods to determine the intersection point we are given the open loop transfer function of the system that is GSHS equals to K upon S, S plus 2 and S plus 3. This is the open loop transfer function of the system. Now first we will apply our first method. In first method we, what we were doing we were putting s equals to j omega in the characteristic equation of the system. So characteristic equation is what 1 plus g s h s equals to 0. This is the characteristic equation. Putting the value of g s h s from here we are having k upon s s plus 2 s plus 3 equals to 0. Solve it. To obtain the simplified characteristic equation, we are having S, S plus 2, S plus 3 plus K equals to 0. So we are having S, S square plus 3S plus 2S is 5S plus 2, 3, 6 plus 6 K equals to 0. So we are having S cube plus 5S square plus 6S plus K equals to zero so this is our characteristic equation now in this characteristic equation put s equals to j omega okay so j omega putting here we are getting j omega cube then we have 5 s square so 5 j omega square plus 6 s means 6 j omega plus k equals to zero now here we are having j cube. We know that j square is equals to minus 1. So here we are having minus j omega cube. j square has become minus 1. So we are having minus 1 and 1 j is left. So we have put j here. Now here we are having j square. So we will replace it by minus 1. So minus 5 omega square. Then we have plus 6 j omega plus k equals to 0. Simplify this further we are having two constant terms without j minus 5 omega square and k. So it will be k minus 5 omega square plus taking j common from these two terms it will be j 6 omega minus here omega cube equals to 0. <coughs> So when we simplify this equation, we are getting two parts. This is our real part and this is the imaginary part. Equating these real part and imaginary parts to 0, we will have k minus 5 omega square equals to 0 and here we will have g 6 omega minus omega cube equals to 0. Take omega common, 
we will have 6 minus omega square equals to 0 so when we equate it to 0 we will get two values omega equals to 0 or 6 minus omega square equals to 0 6 equals to omega square so omega will be equals to plus minus under root of 6 putting here uh, solve this we will have k equals to 5 omega square and uh, if we use here omega equals to 0 and omega equals to so for omega equals to 0 k will be 0 and for omega equals to plus minus under root of 6 we will have k equals to 5 plus minus under root of 6 whole square so it will be 6 so 5 into 6 will be 30 so we have got two values one is for uh, omega equals to 0 k equals to 0 and second is omega equals to plus minus under root k and k equals to 30 so this was the first method to obtain the intersection point now the second method is using the root stability criteria so the uh, characteristic equation which we have obtained was sq plus 5s square plus 6s plus k equals to zero this was a characteristic equation which we have obtained so use form the root array here highest power of s is cube so we will start from s cube then s square then s1 then s to the power zero coefficient of s cube is one then we will have another odd term coefficient that is s to the power one coefficient is six now s square coefficient is 5 and s to the power 0 coefficient is k. How to obtain s to the power 1 coefficient? Multiply this with this minus 1 into k divided by 5. So 5 6 are 30 minus 1 into k is k divided by 5. And this will be 0 because we are not having further coefficients here. Now how to obtain uh, a coefficient of s to the power 0 multiply this with this minus this divided by this so we will having 30 minus k upon 5 into this k minus 5 into 0 is 0 divided by this that is 30 minus k upon 5 so this and this they will be cancelled out so we are left with k only and other coefficient will be 0 so our root array will be s cube s square s to the power 1 0 1 6 5 k 30 minus k upon 5 0 and this is k and 0 so this is our root array we have formed it now to find out the intersection point of the root loci with the imaginary axis then you have to put this 30 minus k upon 5 equals to 0 that is this coefficient you have to put it equals to 0 so 30 minus k upon 5 equals to 0 obtain the value of k from this equation 30 minus k equals to 0 so k will be equals to 30 okay now the again to find out the intersection point what you have to do you have to write the auxiliary or the subsidiary equation using this s square that is the coefficient which you have put equals to 0 just above that whatever row you are having write the subsidiary equation for that row so using this row we will write the subsidiary equation that is 5 s square plus k s to the power 0 and equate it to 0 form the auxiliary or the subsidiary equation so 
So this will be 5 s square plus k equals to 0 s to the power 0 is 1. So putting here the value of k as 30 we will got uh, get 5 s square plus 30 equals to 0. So 5 s square equals to minus 30 and s will be equals to plus minus under root of 6 j. So this is the value of s and uh, we will get from here if we put the, take the value of omega. So omega will be plus minus under root of 6 and k is equals to 30. So this is the intersection point of the root loci branches on the uh, imaginary axis and we have used the two methods first method was to put s equals to j omega and second method is to use the roots stability criteria so this was our rule number seven now rule number eight Now, if the poles of the system which we have obtained in the first step, if the poles are complex poles, then we will determine the angle of departure and angle of arrival for the complex poles. So, our rule number 8 is to determine the angle of departure and angle of arrival. So how we can determine these angles of departure and arrival? There are formulas for it. So the angle of departure, that is the departure angle from complex pole is given by phi departure equals to 180 degrees minus phi p minus phi z. So this is the formula for the uh, calculation of the angle of departure. It is equals to 180 degree minus phi p minus phi z. So what is phi p? Phi p it is the phi p1 plus phi p2 till Phi p n that is the sum of all the angles subtended by all other poles. Okay, that is uh, suppose we are calculating the departure angle for a pole. Uh, and which is P then we will take the sum of all the other poles and uh, sum of all the angles which are subtended by all the other poles suppose we are taking for s equals to minus 1 plus 2 j this is the complex pole for that pole we are having other three poles also so from the angle subtended by all the other three poles to this pole is the phi P and phi z it is phi z1 plus phi z2 plus till phi zn that is sum of all the angles subtended by all uh, uh, all the zeros Okay. So phi p it is the sum of all the angles subtended by all other poles and phi z it is the sum of all the angles subtended by the zeros. Put the value of phi p and phi z in this formula to calculate the angle of departure from the complex pole. Now we have angle of arrival. So angle of arrival is 
if uh, a complex zero is given to us okay so phi arrival is equals to minus 180 degree plus phi p minus phi z okay so this is the formula to calculate the arrival angle here again phi p it is the sum of all the angles subtended by the poles and phi z is the sum of uh, all the angles subtended by all other zeros so the difference between both the formulas is just for the sign in phi uh, departure angle we were having 180 degree minus phi p minus phi z and here we are having minus 180 degree plus phi p minus phi z so just the difference of sign now take an example to understand that what is an angle of arrival and what is an angle of departure how we are going to calculate it Consider a pole zero diagram of a system. We have plotted the poles and zeros of a system on the real axis and the imaginary axis that is on the S plane. Here we are having minus 1, minus 2, minus 3 and minus 4. Here it is 0, it is 1 and this is 2. So we are having a pole as S equals to minus 2. We are having a 0 at S equals to minus 4. Okay. And we are having complex poles uh, here. Okay, so this system it is having three poles and one zero. One pole is at S equals to minus two and uh, uh, the other two poles they are the complex poles. Okay, denote them as P1, P2 and here we are having P3 and this is our zero Z1. Now we will calculate the angles for it. So the departure angle from this pole P1 it can be calculated by the formula that is phi departure angle from pole P1. So departure angle formula is 180 degree minus phi P minus phi Z. It is the departure angle formula. Substitute the value of the angles phi p we have three poles p1 p2 p3 so for p1 we will have phi p2 plus phi p3 okay and uh, phi z will be what phi of z1 okay now how we are going to calculate it we are having here join these two points okay then this angle and this angle this angle is the departure angle from this pole z1 and this pole p1 this is the zero and this is pole so this will be phi z1 here we are having the departure angle as phi p2 okay and this will be the departure angle phi p3 for this pole p1 okay so phi z1 we can calculate from here phi p2 and phi p3 take the sum of these two and subtract minus uh, phi z1 from this and we will be able to get put all the values we will be able to get the departure angle for this pole p1 
P1. So in this way, we calculate the departure and arrival angle for complex poles whenever we are plotting the root locus of a system. Now next we have rule number 9. So rule number 9 is to determine the values of K on the root locus. As we know that the root locus, with the help of root locus, we can determine the value of K on all the points which are lying on the root locus. So, how we will uh, determine the value of K? We have a formula for it. K is equal to the So how we can determine the value of K on the root locus? We have a point P and on that point we have to determine the value of K. So K is given by the ratio or we can say that the product of length of the vectors drawn from the poles of the open loop transfer function to point P. We have to take the product of all the vectors length from the poles here and divided by product of lengths of vectors drawn from the zeros of the open loop transfer function to the point P. So when we take this ratio we will be able to get the value of the K that is the gain of the system on the point uh, this P which is lying on the root locus. So these are the nine rules which we are going to use whenever we want to plot the root locus of a system. Now in this take a have a note and keep this note in mind that when k is equals to 0 there will be no roots on the imaginary axis. That is whenever you have to use the condition that k is equals to 0, just remember that there will be no roots on the imaginary axis. And second point is if k is less than 0, then the closed loop system is stable. That means in the ninth rule we are getting the value of k. So if we are getting the value of k as 0 then you can say that the system is not having any roots on the imaginary axis and if the value of k is uh, you are getting it is less than 0 then the closed loop system is sta uh, unstable and if k is greater than 0 the system is stable. So this we can say about the value of k which we have obtained in rule number 9 that when k is 0 the system is having no roots on the imaginary axis. When k is less than 0 the system is unstable. When k is greater than 0 the system is stable. So these were the rules which we used while plotting the root locus of a system. You have to keep all these rules in mind because step by step we are using them to solve the problems based on the root locus. I hope this video is clear to you. Thank you.